welcome. Thank you for joining us in Aurora board. Hopes that you are all well. Um, as Peter said, I'm Linda Olson. I'm the vice president of the American Rock Art Research Association. I'm a documentation specialist and I reside in Minot, North Dakota, where I'm joining you from. We are enjoying our lengthening days this time of year with some unseasonably warm weather. The American Rock Art Research Association is a diverse community of members with wide ranging interests who are all dedicated to rock art preservation, research and education in order to communicate to a broad audience the significance of rock art as a non-renewable resource of enduring cultural value and an important expression of our shared cultural heritage. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. The Aurora board members are pleased you have joined us in this online event. We are planning to host more events, including our annual conference online. So please stop in and visit us at the website, stay up to date on Aurora and like us on Facebook to be notified of our developments. Mark your calendars now for the conference June 12th and 13th. Everyone knows the pandemic has disrupted our lives in ways nobody could have foreseen. The Aurora Board of Directors and the conference committee realize that there will not be enough of us vaccinated by spring to have an in-person per conference. After missing out completely in 2020, because of the pandemic's terrible timing, we are planning a virtual live streaming conference to keep in touch and keep up to date with new developments in the realm of rock art research. Aurora 2021 will be professionally live streamed, but the program will look familiar to participants. The program will consist of 15 minute papers with five minute and five minute virtual field trips using video format. Publication of papers will be done in the standard way with a volume of American Indian rock art being distrib distributed to members this spring and another plan for the spring of 2021. The website has information you might find helpful and interesting as you can learn more about our organization. We invite you to please consider renewing or joining if you haven't been a member. Uh, your membership support is important to our organization's mission and our ability to accomplish that. Tonight, I am very honored to present a scholar of rock art, Mavis Greer. Mavis Greer has operated an archeological consulting business in Wyoming with her husband since 1978. She received her BA and MA degrees in anthropology from the University of Montana in her home state. Her PhD in anthropology is from the University of Missouri with a dissertation on the rock art of central Montana. Mavis has authored numerous journal articles, contributed rock art themed chapters to archeological books, and is co-editor of the book, Rock Art and Sacred Landscapes. She has served on the boards of several organizations. She's a past president of Aurora, IFRA, Plains Anthropology, Montana, excuse me, Montana Archeological Society, Wyoming Archeological Society, and Casper chapter of the Wyoming Archeological Society. She is a recipient of the Aurora Claus Wellman Memorial Award and of the Wyoming Archaeological Society's Golden Trowel Award. Thank you folks, stay safe, take care, and enjoy the show. Uh, thank you, Linda. 14 years ago today, we were in the desert in Western Egypt. In addition to John and me, uh, the people you see along the bottom of the photo here were all there. That includes uh, nine of us from the States, many of whom you know, uh, Jeffrey from Scotland and Astrid from Denmark. Jeff Lefebvre, Right here, he was the uh, instigator of the trip and he arranged for us to travel to the Western Desert. And we traveled with Andres Zabori of Hungary. He has taken many trips to this area and he has also authored um, many publications on the rock art that we visited. However, what's an adventure to Egypt without uh, visiting the pyramids and the tombs of the pharaohs? So once our uh, desert trip was decided, Evelyn Billow pointed out that we really needed to see the Nile, and some of us agreed. So Evelyn said about arranging for us to tour that area, and she got in contact with Ruth over here. 
who operates All One World Egypt Tours out of the US. Uh, she uh, teams with Ehab right here, who is an Egyptian native and guide. And uh, they together arranged our uh, Nile trip. Uh, Ehab um, thinks he is or should or could be uh, a descendant of the pharaohs because he teaches people about them all the time. And he, even if he's not, uh, he looked to us like he should be a king. Uh, so tonight, you're going to see Egypt through my eyes. This is a part of the world that you can find extensive information about on the web. Many photos on the web of all areas, including some of those areas that I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, everyone takes away something different from a trip there and uh, all the people pictured here uh, would have a different perspective from me, even though we share memories of the trip. So tonight you're just going to get my adventure. Our, our trip started in Cairo. Uh, John and I arrived at the airport and took a taxi to our hotel where we we're going to meet the other people to go on the Nile portion of our trip. Uh, the hotel we stayed at was near the Giza pyramids, and so the ride there was relatively long, and uh, we were in a taxi that was going down a really fast-moving multi-lane highway, chatting away with uh, the driver when all of a sudden all the traffic came to a stop. It turns out a woman was trying to cross the six lanes of traffic and didn't make it. Well, our driver was just really matter-of-fact about it, and he said, well, a lot of people come out and commit suicide this way, you know. We were shocked and happy our car wasn't the one that hit her, uh, but it was a really memorable introduction to the country. After our first day of seeing pyramids outside of Cairo, uh, we had dinner on a balcony restaurant that overlooked the Giza pyramids and the Sphinx and it gave us a preview of what we were going to see the next day. Now up in this uh, photo here in the corner, you can see what we could see off of that balcony, which is modern day Cairo here and ancient Cairo back there. Also down here in the lower left, we have um, more of Cairo in 2007. I don't know if it's still that way today with the pandemic, but at that time uh, there were many, many um, vendors at each site but they kept them all concentrated and really away from the main site area. So um, they were not interfering with the visitors or the photographs that they were taking. I want you to see the um, bottles of water here on the table. Uh, while we were along the mile, we enjoyed a lot of water, but this was to become a very priceless commodity in the desert where we each were only allowed two bottles per person per day of this size. Uh, the older pyramids outside of Cairo were interesting to see, but these at Giza were the most exciting. And it was just amazing to be there in person after having you know, learned about them our entire lives and seen pictures of them. It was almost surreal really to be at this UNESCO World Heritage Site. This site is also um, one of the oldest seven wonders of the ancient world, and it is the only one that's uh, largely intact today. Over here, I have the map of uh, the pyramids, how they relate to one another and the Sphinx, and how um, the layout is for their surrounding, essentially graveyard, which is what this site is comprised of. <laughs> uh, the, Three pyramids that are here were built over about an 80 year span. They were made during what's uh, termed the Old Kingdom in Egypt. And they're the royal tombs uh, of three pharaohs, which are all part of the same family. This was the father, the son, and the grandson. The father, uh, Khufu, has the largest pyramid, which was 481 feet tall even though it doesn't look that way in this uh, photo due to their perspective. The, the father, he was the second king of the fourth dynasty. And then it was um, a few years after his death that uh, Khafre became the fourth king of the fourth dynasty. His pyramid is only about uh, 10 feet shorter than his father's. 
Um, none of these pyramids, though, today are the size they were at the time of construction because uh, once they were constructed, they were all encased with limestone. And uh, that limestone is no longer present except for the very top here of uh, Khafre's tomb. Now, the shortest pyramid is the grandson, and it was only 218 feet tall. The grandson, who is Mikaru, uh, was the fifth king of the fourth dynasty. These people of, of e Egypt at this time, they thought that the kings were somewhere between humans and gods, and uh, that they were chosen by the gods to serve as the mediators on earth. And once they died, then they uh, returned to where the gods were. And in order to get back to that place, they, uh, they went on what was called the solar boat. Uh, this is uh, Khufu's boat. It was uh, found right next to his pyramid. But even more interesting than that is now displayed exactly at that location, only up in the air. Um, and it was buried just directly underneath here then. Today, it's covered with this structure, which per, really protects it from the environment. And then there is a pathway down here where the visitors walk uh, to protect it from the visitors. The Great Sphinx is part of uh, Khafre's pyramid, and it also represents him. It's his head here on top of a lion's body. The whole structure is about 240 feet long and 60 feet, 66 feet tall at its highest point. And here are the birds sitting on top of his head. It's so long that I couldn't get it all in this picture. So I inset uh, his tail right here, which curls up. Now, after they um, were no longer using this uh, burial ground, the uh, sands came in and tried to reclaim it. It wasn't until the 1800s that uh, people decided to renovate it for uh, visitors. And they started by digging out the Sphinx here. This, is, this photo they think was taken in the late 1800s, but it wasn't until 1925 when the entire Sphinx was excavated to the point where he is today. You can see they keep the sand out of it today. In this lower left picture here, you can see the walkway that they've constructed for the viewing of the Sphinx, which uh, protects it from visitors and uh, people getting too near. Uh, from Cairo, we went down to uh, see the ruins down near Luxor. <clears throat> These uh, sites that we visited down here are newer, they date to the New Kingdom. And um, the first place that we visited was uh, Queen Hatshepsut's temple, which is one of the earliest temples in the New Kingdom. She has a very impressive walkway uh, to um, enter her temple, but it's almost just as impressive if you're looking at it from the doorway back out, which you can see here. This temple, like all the others in this area, is just uh, covered with hieroglyphs in the interior and lots of uh, paintings of um, people, humans that are um, men and gods. They're very colorful, as you can see in this and in this photo. But there are also um, many of the typical Egyptian hieroglyphs here. Among the hieroglyphs at this queen's temple is this large bull. You can see it's flanked by sort of typical Egyptian hieroglyphs, both to the bottom and to the side. Uh, when we were here, we didn't think much about the importance of cattle as we were pretty much focused on the Egyptian symbols that we were seeing. But once we got into the desert, we realized the importance of uh, cattle to the Egyptian culture both from the early on and extending all the way through the dynasties. And it made us look back at the cattle along the Nile with much better understanding. Uh, the Valley of the Kings was an area we all really look forward to visiting. It, the valley is on the west side of the Nile, which the west represents the hereafter. So that's where they uh, bury their dead. This um, valley is well protected. As you can see, there's a barrier here even to get in. 
This building is where you get a ticket so that you can visit the tombs. One ticket will allow you to visit three tombs, and then you can get an extra one that will allow you to uh, see King Tut's tomb, which of course we did. At the time we were there, there were 63 tombs that had been excavated or were in the process of being, and um, many of those were still under renovation. Uh, here are some of the high points of the Valley of the Kings uh, site complex, starting with the plan map here, which shows you where the um, tombs are that have been excavated. They're little black dots and this large pathway that's been developed to allow you to access them. Down here, you can see the pathway a little better. Uh, also in this photo, you can see uh, the entrances to the different tombs. There are three of them that are showing up here. At each entrance, there is a sign that tells you, you whose tomb it is, like this one is from uh, King Tut's tomb. Now over here, it's, it's somewhat deceptive, but looking at these entrances, you look like you might just be walking directly in, but that's not the case. Over on, on this right side of the screen, you can see that each one had a really um, elaborate staircase to get down into these tombs. This is uh, Evelyn and Alice behind her coming out of Ramsey's, the first tomb. Now, even though all of these tombs um, had been ransacked in terms of the bodies were gone and a lot of the grave goods were gone, they still were very impressive with all of the artwork uh, intact. And with the renovation, it was all bright and very impressive with um, many uh, humans and gods and lots of just standard uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs showing there. In fact, it was almost overwhelming how um, many there were and how bright and colorful they were. Especially when you consider that the Valley of the Kings was mainly used between 1539 and 1075 BC. Uh, across the Nile from the Valley of the Kings is the town of Luxor with its many ancient temples. And this area has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1979. Uh, here you're looking at the uh, Grand Procession Way entrance into the Karnak Temple Complex. Uh, this uh, procession way is lined with uh, ram-headed sphinxes. And um, the procession way uh, joins this Karnak Temple complex, which is sort of out of the town of Luxor with downtown Luxor. Now the Karnak Temple were the uh, religious center of Europe and the large uh, Egypt and the largest one of Egypt. Um, whereas downtown Luxor was sort of the government of Egypt, the central government of Egypt for quite some time. Uh, the Karnak complex was constructed over hundreds of years as many pharaohs wanted to leave their mark on this um, very religious site. This resulted in multiple temples within the complex, obelisk, um, pillars, uh, and great gates that um, marked the entrances to the different uh, parts of the complex, as well as thousands of hieroglyphs. The building of the Karnak complex started in the Middle Kingdom, which was about 1908 BC, and it continued all the way up to the Ptolemaic dynasty, which was a Greek royal family that ruled Egypt from 305 to 30 BC, and they were considered to be the last dynasty of ancient Egypt. At this temple complex, there are 134 of the columns that show here up in the upper left, and they were arranged in 16 rows, some of which you can see in this photo, and they all were covered with hieroglyphs. Not that that was unusual, the entire complex is, tired, is uh, covered with hieroglyphs. Down here in this open air room, where Bob is taking some photographs, you can see that um, every little vacant space was covered with hieroglyphs. Now the Luxor temples are open at night when they have an elaborate lighting systems that really shows off the, um, the statues that are there, the, the pillars that are there, and even the hieroglyphs that are there. 
in addition to sort of the standard hieroglyphs, um, at, at Karnak, there were a few uh, incisions of chariots and uh, their drivers and the horses that are associated with them. I am impressed with these and I was interested in them, I guess, because of the horses that we see in our part of the world. These horses at Karnak were uh, well made in, in great detail, showing that the people that uh, were placing them on the wall were very familiar with these horses. We see that in our part of the world where when horses are introduced, they aren't drawn to near the detail as they are 100 years later when people are so familiar with their anatomy. Now at Karnak, there are several of these obelisks. These are most impressive and they're also a special draw for people from the States since uh, the Washington Monument is based on these obelisks. However, these at Karnak are true obelisks. They are carved out of a single piece of rock. And like everything else in this temple complex, they are covered with hieroglyphs. Now, one of the more interesting things to me at this temple complex are these grooves. These are on exterior walls, some of which are shown here. These are similar to grooves we see in sacred places elsewhere in the world. In North America, we find them at rock art sites uh, that are used for sacred ceremonies. And we also find them on some of the early churches. As a matter of fact, there's a good example on the Catholic Church in the Wind River, um, on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. And of course, they've also been found on a lot of churches in Europe. And um, Ken Hedges wrote about that not all that long ago in uh, one of the American Indian rock art. Uh, the, these grooves in all of these different parts of the country all have the same thing in common in that they are trying to obtain power from a sacred place. Leaving Luxor, we traveled to Abydos. Um, that trip was memorable for more than just the dense traffic, which you can see here in this upper left. Uh, we also passed by the hills of Nahamadi, where in 1945, uh, scrolls were found that contained uh, the secret teachings of Jesus, as well as gospels written by his disciples and by his brothers, Thomas and James. But even more memorable uh, were um, these rifle toting guys along the, the route in which we took a couple of uh, discreet photos of. We were pretty surprised to find out that these people were there to guard us. They wanted to make sure all the tourist buses got through because Abydos economy is dependent on tourism and they could not afford for us not to make it through. When we got to Abydos, this is the temple that we visited. It was built primarily by Seti I and Ramses II during the New Kingdom. But Abydos was a place of pilgrimage for ancient Egyptians from, for centuries. And one of the reasons that they all wanted to come there was because this place was associated with the god Osiris and his head is supposed to be buried here. As with the other temples, this one was covered with hieroglyphs inside and out. You can see some of the exterior ones right here in this central photo. But this is outside. And again, this whole area up here is full of grooves where people were um, trying to obtain power from this sacred site. Uh, while in this uh, Southern Nile area, we visited Hathor's temple. Hathor is the cow goddess of ancient Egypt, and she's associated with queens. Uh, she has a counterpart for kings, which is the god Horus, and he's associated with the hawk and the falcon. Now, this particular temple that we saw was actually built during the Greek era, but it was placed on top of an older Hathor temple. So inside this temple are many really narrow passageways, as you can see on both sides here, they're covered with hieroglyphs and um, pictures of humans and gods and all, all very impressive. But there is no cow imagery here. 
It all is associated with star goddesses and with the hawk, uh, which is the king symbol, which was sort of disappointing for the cow goddess temple. But considering the number of cows we were gonna see in rock art in the country later on, I decided it was still fitting to end our Nile portion of the expedition with the cow goddess temple. As we leave the Nile, there's nothing that shows the contrast between the fertile river valley and the desert to the west than uh, the view we had from a hot air balloon, which we rode early one morning while we were down in Luxor. At this point, we were about to have a life-changing event from whole living in hotels and eating in restaurants to camping and having intense and having camp food. We were also about to experience water rationing and the impact of blowing sand on zippers and on cameras and even on our unwashed for days dry skin. On March 10th of 2007, our guide Andres picked us up at our hotel in Cairo. And here we are uh, loading up our personal stuff, which included not only our clothes and cameras, but tents and sleeping bags that we brought from home. Andres, he brought along the water and the food that we needed. We were heading out to the desert with four Toyota Land Cruisers and five Egyptian drivers. The cruisers had room for two people to ride in the front and then six people rode in the back on benches, which you can see in these two photos. Uh, two of our vehicles carried people and some supplies and two of our vehicles uh, mainly carried supplies with only people in the front seat. Now supplies included diesel for four trucks for 16 days, all the food and water that we would need for 18 people and um, plus our personal gear. And as I mentioned, the water was limited to just the two bottles per day per person. The first day we traveled 484 miles on paved roads. And this photo shows the roads. Even though the roads were pretty good, it was sort of rough riding um, because of our cramped quarters. But along the way, we saw signs for oil fields, which were really interesting to me because a lot of them were the same oil field signs that we would see here in Wyoming. And we saw sand that acted like snow. As you can see here, it's um, blowing across the highway. Uh, our first night, uh, we arrived at a little town where we spent the night and the next morning where we were uh, getting things together, which is shown here in this upper right photo, uh, we added fuel that we needed with us. And we also picked up an Egyptian military officer. He was a requirement of the government for us to go into the back country. We had to have him with us. Our military officer was this young guy, 20-something, uh, and he was definitely more interested in looking good, which was hard to do in the desert, than it was um, traveling with us on this trip. Well, but that was all right. The second day we set off, again on paved roads like down here, we traveled for 168 miles on the pavement before we turned off into the unmarked uh, sands of the Salima sand sheet. And at that point, our vehicles would often travel four abreast, just like you can see in this photo. Uh, once we got off on this sand, uh, we were navigating with GPS and the drivers were very good at it. We never got lost even though we were mostly in just flat, sandy areas this first uh, few hours with uh, the only interruption in it being these large dunes, which you hopefully can see here down in this uh, lower right photo. Now, Bob Mark, he brought along a GPS and he marked our entire route for us, which is really nice. This is his map. It's showing us here we started in Cairo. We came down the highway all the way down to this point where we then left and started off across the sand sheet. As you can tell from this GPS, we did leave the country a couple of times. Down here in the corner, we went into Sudan. And over here, as we were driving back up, we went into Libya. However, this is just unmarked desert sand. And without a GPS, we really wouldn't have known that we weren't in Egypt for the whole time. Uh, the first remains we saw were not rock art, but 
gas cans. Uh, these were left during World War II to mark a runway for an improvised British airfield that was used between 1940 and 1943 by the Allied forces. The cans were fashioned into a big arrow here. You can see um, Astrid and Marglyph standing on the end of the arrow. And um, they were also uh, fashioned into a sign right here. This says Eight Bells, which is the name of the airfield. In addition to cans that were left here, there was also an engine from a vehicle. And this was a military vehicle that's now almost been completely swallowed up by the sands. This um, part of the country is part of the Gilf, Gilf Kabir National Park, which was established on January 1st, 2007, only a couple of months before we arrived. Finally, we arrived at our first desert rock art site, Shaw's Cave. And um, this is in the southern part of the Gilf, and it's in the only rock art site known in the southern part of the Gilf National Park. The park begins here about at the end of this arrow and extends on northwest in sort of an oblong shape. This was the first hike we had across uh, sands interspersed with uh, bedrock which was to become a very um, familiar landscape to us for hiking as it would, we would be in this area for the next uh, several days. We finally arrived up here at the shelter at Shaw's Cave, but it wasn't really a cave, it was simply a small rock shelter. The shelter was full of multicolored cattle. There were some herders in here and a few other figures, but by and large, uh, cattle of different colors dominated the rock art. As you can tell, it was very uh, well executed. Uh, this site was named after the person who first published it, and he did so in June of 1936 in a volume of antiquity. However, the article was pretty brief and he didn't really tell much about the site. And nothing was really written on the site again until 1997 when it was published in French in the uh, in a journal Sahara, where they described the site in more detail. The uh, history of this area reports that cows were revered in the Egyptian desert as a source of life. And this was not hard for us to imagine. We hardly saw any animals um, the entire time we we're out in the desert. As a matter of fact, even a bug was uh, an occasion for everybody to get out their camera and rush off to take a photo of it. And one night when we had a fox come into our camp, he was a big source of entertainment and a lot of attempts at photography. When we left Shaw's cave, we continued southwest to the very um, corner of Egypt, and, which is a region known as the Jebel Uwainat Mountains. We spent time here at the Kakur Valley, and um, we set up camp in this little canyon uh, where we um, spent several days as we went around looking at uh, various sites in the Kakur Valley. According to a 2018 publication by Andras, this area at that time had 720 rock art sites. 414 of them were pictographs and 347 were petroglyphs. 41 of them had uh, both pictographs and petroglyphs. But don't worry, I'm not gonna show you all of them. In fact, most of them uh, looked quite a bit alike from one to the next. So I'll be very selective tonight. However, if you do wanna see more, I encourage you to contact Andras and go on a trip with him. It's really a good place not to uh, see many people. We hardly saw a dozen people, I'm not sure we saw that many while we were gone, and everybody was there to look at rock art. However, if you'd rather just learn about these sites from your couch or your computer, you don't wanna suffer through the desert environment, there are many publications out there today on these sites, and you can check uh, Lee Marymore's rock art uh, bibliography on the University of Northern Arizona's website to get you started. Now, typical for Egypt, as I say, cattle are numerous in the Kerkur Valley. They're portrayed in herds and as individual figures, and they're also shown as both petroglyphs and really colorful pictographs. 
although none of these have been directly dated, um, environmental evidence and relative dating from other archaeological studies um, shows that this cattle pastoralist uh, rock art style was made about 3,000 to 4,000 years ago when the climate was much more favorable to habitation than it is today. In addition to cows, this area has many humans, although Andras uh, does find it there, there is considerable variation in the humans made by these cattle pastoralists. He also found that they had a well-established um, conventions for how to portray the human body. And you can see that here. Uh, they have pretty much a triangular torso, really narrow waist, uh, well-defined legs, arms that often just end right at about where the elbow would be, though sometimes like down here, uh, they're bent up at the elbow. Almost nobody has any hands, and there are some people with feet. In all cases, these humans seem to be extremely active. In this case, they are overpainted by a few cows, but uh, based on their style, these are all um, within a few years, so they're considered contemporary. Here are cows and a giraffe on the same panel. Andres has written about the co-occurrence of these animals in the petroglyphs in this area. And he found that of those 347 petroglyph sites in this region, 248 of them contained giraffes or cattle. And among those, 130 have only cattle, which is to be expected. They're so prominent in this area. 76 have only giraffes and 42 have both, this, both on the same panel, such as this one does. However, with all of these sites, there are only seven of them that have any superpositioning with the cat, with giraffes and cattle. And of those seven sites, four times the cattle are superimposed over the giraffes and three times the giraffes are superimposed over the cattle. So he was concluded that the, just a short time lapse between these uh, overlapping layers and essentially all of these figures were contemporary. However, the cattle do disappear from this region before the giraffe. And uh, there's become strong evidence, Andres has reported, that the cattle pastoralists use the area between the really limited dates of 4400 to 3300 BC. And then the giraffe continued on after the disappearance of the cattle for about another 1000 years. Here we have some more giraffes on the left and some camels on the right. In the mid 1920s, a guy named uh, Ahmed Hassanain Bey, who was an Egyptian explorer, was the first to report rock art in the Jebel Yuanit region. He thought that, that since no camels were shown on the same panels as giraffes, the giraffe rock art must have been made prior to 670 BC, which was the time that the cattle came into this area with the Assyrian invasion of Egypt. So there's very little uh, question about their time of introduction. However, um, more recent research has shown that the giraffe continued after that date. But uh, even based on, on this type of research, Hassan, Hen Hassan Nine Bay is still acknowledged as the first to recognize the antiquity of the rock art in this mountain region. Now this lower photo down here has received um, some analysis attention from Andras. So I wanna show it to you in a little more detail. And the area of interest I've circled in red here. This top human has a circular shape at the end of his arm. And Andras has interpreted this to be a lasso. He points out that this is a common depiction of humans in front of uh, giraffes in this area. Then the next person down is shown with his um, arm just attached to the head of this giraffe, which Andres has interpreted that he's then lassoed the giraffe. Now he doesn't talk about these two being the same people, but um, based on how things were done in biographic rock art in North America, it wouldn't surprise me that the artist was portraying the same person, showing first that he was going out with his lasso and then that he had accomplished the task. 
Uh, this is something possibly that um, they will look into in the future in uh, this part of the world. Now, in addition to the drafts on this panel, we see uh, two oryx, this one and this one. Um, they do occur in the rock art of this area. Uh, they were contemporary with the giraffes and the cattle, but they're just not as, as common as those other two animals are. This is one of the complex panels in this region. It's one of several. Uh, this is, again, dominated by cows and humans in the typical pastoralist style. These people, however, they'll have a little more individualization than some that we've seen. This guy appears to have a hat here. This person has a skirt on. And if you look really closely, it almost looks like this person has a hand, which is really unusual. But as, you, as typical of uh, this style, all of these uh, people are in very active positions. Now, Andres has proposed a chronology for the paintings in this area based on the humans and I've sort of simplified it here uh, to present tonight. Uh, he has the earliest humans were painted with round heads and they sometimes carried bows and arrows um, and occasionally were associated with uh, giraffes. Then the next um, era of human painting, the humans are very tiny and these small people carry bows and arrows, and some of them are definitely home, shown hunting giraffes. Also, these small um, individuals sometimes depicted just a mother and children. And then comes the era of the pastoralist, where the humans are, are very detailed like they are in this photo and associated with cows. Well, considering that we know uh, these paintings were done between uh, 4400 and 3300 BC, we know that all those other humans had to have been done prior to that. Uh, the Jubel Iwainot area also has grooves. As you can see, these are nearer the ground than others we saw in Egypt. I didn't find any publications on these. I guess with those complicated panels in this region, such as the one in the previous photo, uh, the grooves just haven't uh, received a lot of attention. However, I did find them of interest and especially these uh, relative to the ones we saw along the Nile because these are the long um, grooves that we associate with tool grooves in uh, our part of the world as opposed to the, the smaller, uh, deeper and wider ones that we find where uh, people are trying to uh, abstract power from a sacred place. Now, the Western Desert was not always as unpopulated as it is today. At the beginning of the Neolithic, this area was humid and it supported residents that left behind um, all sorts of stone features, such as these two shown here on the left. And they left behind a lot of lithic artifacts. Some of these um, are the ones that we saw during our hikes in the uh, mountains looking at rock art. However, we also saw lithics that dated to the Paleolithic period, so there must have been a really long uh, time period of occupation in this desert before it was essentially abandoned once the pastoralist left. Considering the importance of cattle here in the um, Jubel Yuanet area, I thought it appropriate to leave this part of the tour with the picture of Andres photographing one of these complex cattle panels. Here are the cows all across the ceiling here. You can see that they're multicolored, uh, really nicely done, and some of them are really large. This uh, photo also provides a view of the uh, surrounding landscape within this uh, mountain area where there are large rock out coppings interspersed with areas of sand. They have some um, really spindly trees occurring here and some ground level plants or weeds. Uh, 
We're now on our way back to the Gilf Kabir National Park, but uh, this time we're going to be on the west side of it. During our drive across this open sands, we have occasional stops for photos and for bathroom breaks. As you can see, privacy was not easily obtained in this landscape. This was a photographic stop, obviously. See Evelyn, I think that's Evelyn at the bottom here. Andres up here, Gerald up here. We arrived at the Cave of Swimmers in the Western Gulf Kabir late in the afternoon and we camped nearby. So we had a lot of time to see this site, the Cave of the Swimmers in different lighting conditions. As you can see, the rock shelter is, uh, is really diminished relative to this large outcropping that it's in. But down here, these are people to give you an idea of the scale. This is probably the only rock art site of this area that many people have heard of uh, due to it being featured in the movie, The English Patient. Um, however, the real site was not used in the movie due to its remoteness and instead um, they made a replica of it for the filming. This site is in the Wadi Sura, which loosely translates the Valley of the Pictures because of the rock art in the region. So sometimes instead of being referred to in the uh, reports as the Cave of the Swimmers, it is known as the Wadi Sura One, as the first site uh, found here. The Swimmers Cave received that name in um, 1933 when an explorer of the area saw these humans on the wall and thought they were in swimming and diving positions. However, later analysis has decided that these are probably depicting um, metaphoric trance flight instead of swimming. As you can see in this photo, there are numerous other humans at this site. They are really well done. They're um, bodies and their legs and their arms and they even have hands and fingers that are readily visible. I've inset this uh, picture of the, the shelter so that you get a little better idea of where the rock art is relative to that uh, huge um, outcropping and it's right along here. Hopefully you can see the uh, pointer but it's right along the central part of the interior of this rock shelter. Again, here are three people that are um, providing scale for this, this shelter. These paintings at the Cave of the Swimmers were thought to have been put here between 6,000 and 9,000 years ago. Now, this is still the same site, and uh, but here you can see two of the hand prints that um, are at this site. These are um, underneath this, the red of the swimmers. As you can see, there was probably another one right here that's eroded off. But the superpositioning is really clear down here where three small human dancers are over the top of uh, this hand stencil. The um, hand stencils here then are obviously the, the first uh, paintings at this site. And so they're probably closer to the 9,000 year old date than um, the red humans. Although the distance between the painting of the hand stencils and the humans is really not known. This lower hand is in such good condition and is so clear that uh, based on the finger length, it appears to have been put there by a female. The final rock art site that we saw in the Western Gilf Kabir is the Cave of the Beast. This is known by several other names, including the Zarzura Fogini, the Fogini Mestakawi, and the Wadi Sura II. This site really came to the attention of the world in 2003 after being visited in 2002 by archaeologists Massimo and Jacopo Fogini and uh, a retired colonel from the Egyptian army who's now our desert guide, Ahmed Mestikawi. In 2010, which was three years after we were there, 
the University, the University of Cologne uh, in Germany did an in-depth recording and analysis of the rock art at this site. Uh, we entered the site by crossing this wide sand sheet and uh, then instead of going up this dunal sand, which would have been really hard to traverse, uh, we uh, came up the rocks on the side. This photograph here over on the right shows people moving up that rocky area, which although easier than the sand sheet was just was still not a easy ascent into the shelter. This shows the complex paintings in this shelter that extended from below the floor uh, across the wall to the overhanging ceiling. These uh, figures are so superimposed and so dense that sorting them out would not have been easy. Uh, during the recording, they um, said they had over 5,000 figures painted in red, yellow, white, and black with some petroglyphs. Uh, there are various humans here, sometimes occurring in groups. Some were dancing, some were floating like over at the Cave of the Swimmers. And there were a variety of animals, elephants and ostriches, gazelles and giraffes, but no cows. This site definitely predates the cows. Uh, some figures have both human and animal attributes and especially these figures here and here these are the mythical headless beast from which the cave gets its common name. There are also hundreds of negative hand stencils at this cave. Uh, this uh, photo in the upper uh, left gives you a little better idea of the size of the site and um, the fact that the paintings are all the way down here to the present land or present ground level, and then they're coming all across this sloping uh, wall up to the overhanging ceiling. And down here is an example of the petroglyphs at the site. Uh, we have a row of gazelles. And these two photos here on the right are devoted to the headless beast. This top one is probably one of the best preserved uh, of the pictographs of this image. Uh, you can see that the body is the body of an animal and then the legs are the legs of a human. There are several down here. The tails are really uh, elaborate and on all four of these that you can see here. Uh, during the uh, analysis of the site, they found that these beasts were always surrounded by a variety of humans in motion. And then they said that even though the beast didn't have heads, some of them appeared to be spitting at humans or swallowing humans. And they also found that a lot of these were defaced uh, during prehistoric times, which makes this one even uh, more special in that uh, you can see it as it was painted before anybody did any alterations to it. There were almost uh, 900 negative hand stencils recorded here. Most of the hands were complete, but some of them were missing fingers. They were a variety of sizes. And as published in a 2016 article in the Journal of Archaeological Science, 13 of them might not be human at all. Instead, they thought that they were made off of the hands of the monitor lizard. Now, for those of you who are wondering about a monitor lizard, as I was, I found this picture of one online. Uh, these are native to Africa, and obviously they do have front uh, feet that look pretty human. And this row right here, I hope you can see uh, my little pointer coming across the top of the photograph. These appear to be the ones that uh, the researchers thought were um, people making stencils of the monitor lizard hand. This site, the Cave of the Beast, was um, thought to have been painted about 7,000 years ago, making it contemporary with the Cave of the Swimmers, uh, which seems uh, very reasonable based on the types of images at both places. I titled this photo, Flies, Food, and Sand. 
Although the animals were scarce in the desert, there were days when the flies were not. And when they became overwhelming, we had these net um, headgear pieces that we put over our heads to try to keep our sanity. If you see right above me in this photo, here is a very well-designed um, bull, single, single um, bull with no other cattle around him. Over here, in, we have um, one of our food groups. The food was not elaborate, but it was hard to find food that was going to be non-perishable, that were going to that could feed so many people for so many days. And uh, Wasa crackers really filled the bill. We had them every day, sometimes more than once a day, and I have never eaten them since. As I mentioned, the sand was relentless on us. Um, it was really hard on zippers. Our tent zipper never recovered. It, we had to replace it when we got home. And it was really hard on cameras. And, Every night there was the ritual of the camera cleaning to help preserve them. Here we see uh, John and Gerald finding a place on bedrock above our camp to do their camera cleaning. Now, um, we did get stuck in the sand, even with excellent drivers, knowing how to drive in sandy conditions. So all the vehicles were equipped with these um, strips of laced metal to put under the wheels, just like we have uh, for getting people unstuck in snow. And the whole procedure was the same. We dug the sand out from underneath the wheels, they put the metal pieces on there, and then everybody who wasn't the driver got behind the truck and pushed, and voila, we were out of the sand. It was very similar to getting stuck in snow, only much warmer. So we ended our desert trip at the Siwa Oasis, which was truly a marvelous place. It had water enough for drinking and it had for washing and it had a motel for sleeping and it had restaurants for eating. And um, we were all really happy to be there. Here is a picture of our group as we were in the desert and as we were cleaned up, although this was several years uh, later when some of us uh, got together for this photo at a conference. Uh, anyway, I would like to thank everybody who made this trip possible and all the people who traveled with us and made it so great. And I'd like to thank you for being here with uh, me tonight. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Mavis. That was a great talk. It really transported us to <laughs> from wherever we happened to be <laughs> to a whole different terrain, that's for sure. A um, lot of um, thank yous and stuff in the chat. Um, so this is a chance for you all to ask some questions. You can type your question into the chat and I will present it to Mavis. Um, so let's see what we've got here. Well, Peter, while you're looking at the questions, I should probably let people know. I probably relayed all of the knowledge about Egypt uh, that I have to you already. This is definitely not my area of expertise, although I've really had a good time learning a whole lot more about it while I put this presentation together and refreshing my memory on uh, what we learned while we were there. Yeah, well, uh, we'll see. There might still be some questions. I know uh, a number of people were interested in how the dating was done. You talked a little bit about the relative dating using superposition, but how do you get some of those uh, date ranges like 9,000 to 6,000 and such? Um, those are, I believe, just guesses based on what animals are present in those panels because they know uh, really uh, well when the cattle were there based on archeological excavations and they know uh, when the camels came in. And so uh, based on that, if they have animals that were there prior to um, either of those animals showing up in the rock art 
they're making the assumption that it was earlier. And they're probably right on it as far as how old they are other than uh, their comparisons with archeological excavations. They don't have any other way of doing that yet that I've read about you now. That'd be a great place for people to go in and do a dating project. Right, so they, you said you there was Neolithic um, stone structures there. Um, so that would be associated with the cattle raising, would it? Um, well, a, a little bit. They're a little earlier than the cattle and then standing into the cattle period, right? Which were, the cattle were there from 4,400 to 3,300 BC. So, right, that would overlap it a little bit. Yeah, so in Egypt, it was the Neolithic primarily domesticated animals or were they also doing some kinds of farming as well? Uh, they say that there was some farming in that area just based on the fact that the climatic conditions were better then, but I don't think it was ever very extensive. My guess is it was more like gardens. Mm -hmm. And you said there was also paleo um, uh, artifacts found? We did see uh, Paleolithic uh, hand axes, and they are mentioned in a few of the publications that I looked at, but it doesn't sound like people have really spent any um, time studying the Paleolithic culture of that area. It, that area has uh, amazingly uh, quite a few publications about the rock art, but not a whole lot about the other uh, archaeological remains that I found and the rock and that yet the rock art dating and a lot of uh, information about uh, the people is coming from the few excavations that have been done. Hmm. And what about Neanderthal? Do any of the artifacts date uh, to prior to modern humans? Didn't did not uh, see any information on that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, that was uh, the dating questions. Uh, so people were wondering whether there were threats to these glyphs from inhabitants, if there are any inhabitants nearby, any vandalism alluding to be concerned about? Um, the only vandalism we saw at all is um, from the armies. And the armies of Sudan and some of the others that are coming into the south were spray painting on some of the um, walls in the Jabal Yuwanit area. Um, but other than that, we didn't see any vandalism. There are no people living there. So it would just be the travelers coming through there. And most of the travelers are coming through there to see rock art and they're not gonna vandalize it. So it's primarily the people associated with the military that have done any sort of vandalism. Hmm. Uh, let's see, so there, uh, okay, so the, the recording techniques, are there any differences um, in the recording techniques for these kinds of sites in Egypt? Now, that's a good question, and that I don't know. Even though I read uh, several uh, articles where the recording had been done, they did not go into details about how they did it. As a matter of fact, most of those articles were more into the analysis um, reporting than they were into the reporting of even what kinds of figures were there and went jump directly into what does this mean uh-huh and i recall on some of okay you mentioned at least four colors used at least some of the sites mm -hmm. um are could it be the case that in in the situations where you're missing arms or hands that they were done in a color that didn't survive um, I guess it's possible, although we saw all the various colors on the panels, so I don't think that just the hands would be gone. I mean, it, because they would be in, even if they were in another color, the other colors were still present on the panels. So, so as far as my you know, speculation as far as is that, that they were not. <laughs> right. Um, what? Do you know anything about the explanation for the uh, major change in climate in that region? Uh, no, I do not. I wonder, I wonder if it was the cattle grazing, <laughs> overgrazing. <laughs> um, My guess is those cattle were skinny because even with a different uh, vegetative pattern in there, I expect it was not all that abundant. 
Yeah, okay, here's a question. Uh, has there been any comparison between Egyptian floating figures uh, and South African similar figures from the Drakensberg rock art? Never that I've seen. And did the swimming figures show up anywhere else that um, you're familiar with? And, uh, the only in the uh, Wadi Sura, both at the Cave of the Swimmers, and they were also in um, the Cave of the Beast. The same uh, swimming figures. Oh, the okay. same type, the same style. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, how, okay, here's a question. Do you know how far the art of this style extends into Libya and Sudan? Uh, I don't, but uh, we definitely were in Sudan looking at it in the very northwestern corner. So for sure it's in the, in the um, Jebel Yuanit Mountains uh, area of both Libya and Sudan. Do you know what materials were used to make the colors? Uh, no, but I do know that we, there is some hematite there and we actually did a little grinding of it while we were there. So um, I think that that was the primary basis for the different colors. Uh, how about cupules? I don't think that we saw any, I don't remember. Any, I didn't see any in looking through all of the photos, getting ready for this talk either, so. Well, you found some on the uh, sides of the temples anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, to me, those are completely different. Those are grooves. Uh, I make a big distinction between yeah. grooves and cup meets, so. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, how about de-stretch? Have any of you tried de-stretching to see if anything shows up there that uh, you didn't see with the naked eye? I did not try any de-stretching. Possibly Marglev or Bob and Evelyn, they may have tried it. Uh -huh. Okay, if you tried it uh, and saw anything, send, put something in the chat and let me know. Um, rock circles. Um, yeah, so maybe it, it talk about some of the uh, stone structures that you saw in the area. Uh, I really can't say much about them. <laughs> uh, they, are, uh, they are remains of housing. Uh, houses and of um, uh, areas for animals uh, to be collected. I know that from just reading about them, but um, I can't tell you a lot more beyond that. Yes, nothing looked similar to like European megalithic uh, structures. No, no, not at all. Absolutely yeah. not. These were habitation and animal pens. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. Let's see. Oh, one, one comment of mine on your discussion about the giraffes and the lassoing. Um, you mentioned it could be one person, different stages in there, but it also could be the fact that a giraffe hunt involves a number of people, right? Some to get the giraffes to move around places. So it might be uh, multiple people involved in the hunt. Right? That sure could be. And I know that when they, this particular um, panel, I found a little strange because it didn't really look much like a hunting panel. It looked almost like those giraffes were more um, tame than hunting. Cause I mean, to lasso a giraffe, I think, you know, you'd have to get pretty close to it to begin with. And I'm not sure about uh, the people who were doing it. You think it wasn't actually a lasso being depicted? Or? Well, uh, I defer to Andres, who, who has done a lot of studying there, and he does think it's a lasso, but I just think that maybe those giraffes were not that um, wild. Because to get that close to them and to be able to lasso them, I don't know, but I don't know a lot about giraffe behavior, I must admit. Yeah, I suppose it's also possible that they were symbolic in some way, like some of the South African art, uh, you know, apparently has a metaphor interpretation as opposed to, you know, naturalistic. Right, and that certainly could be the case there. Uh -huh. uh, let me see, we've got a couple new messages. Uh, what kinds of instruments were used to carve the petroglyphs? 
Uh, I assume that all of them were done with uh, rocks. There's certainly plenty of rocks in that area. I don't know. Just yeah, as they, they were in North America, yeah. So was it like rock tools. direct percussion or indirect percussion? Uh, oh, there was everything there. We had, uh, there were also, there was pecking, there was uh, braiding, there was uh, incising, you know, mm. all of these things went on there. Did you find any of the instruments? No, well, I don't think so. I mean, we saw a lot of lithic tools, but we don't, we saw most of those away from the rock art sites. Uh -huh. uh, so Marglyph says in answer to one of the questions, the pastoralists were also found in Algeria and other regions west of Egypt and says that she has a large print of the panel that Mavis used where the arms show up. Oh, and yes, uh, she has used these stretch. Oh, so that's interesting. A large print of the panel that Mavis used where the arms show up. Hmm, okay. So maybe um, D-stretch, okay, D-stretch of the beast showed that there was a lot of patterns on them and some in yellow. Okay, so D-stretch, I guess maybe did bring out some things that weren't uh, so easy to see without it. Thank you, Margliff. Um, okay, question. Were the images thought for hunting preparation or spiritual? I guess. Uh, yeah, but in a lot of what I saw, um, they were definitely hunting those animals. So I don't know. I didn't read anything about where people were concentrating on the spirituality associated with those animals or the religions associated with them at all. Um, out in the Western desert. So I would say most of those were, if you're looking at the cattle and the, the giraffes and all. Now, earlier, the Cave of the Beast in that area, that is obviously uh, has religious connotations. Those are all earlier sites. Yeah, was, was the aurochs in existence in that part of the world? It was, uh-huh. Okay, so some of the earlier cattle uh, images might have been aurochs. Oh, I don't know. They really did the horns uh, in a different manner, so that the aurochs seemed to be very distinctive of how they how they portrayed the uh, horns of the aurochs as opposed to how they portrayed the horns of the cattle. Okay, and there were aurochs depicted there. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, okay. I had one picture where there were two of them on there. Okay, so we've seen giraffe, we've seen cattle, aurochs, um, and no other, What and then the headless, uh, whatever it was, it had looked like a lion's tail or something, didn't it? Right, and then um, we had camels in oh, the right, later, camels. yeah, later yeah, time. a very limited um, group of animals there. Well, actually, at the Cave of the Beast, there were more. There were elephants, um, there were gazelles, there were uh, ostriches. Um, a lot of those that I didn't picture because they don't show up that well. Mm. Yeah, Margliff says there were dogs and, elf and elephants. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, here, here's an interesting question. Is anybody working with Egyptologists to figure out connection, potential connections with later hieroglyphs? I have not seen anything about that. Yeah, because I do recall that there was a discovery not too long ago, maybe some, you know, within maybe the last 10 years of some Paleolithic Egyptian art um, petroglyphs. Are you familiar with that? I am not, and I did not see that either. Oh. Yeah, it may have been you were there before that uh, was discovered. Yeah, if anybody can remember when exactly that was, uh, but I recall reading about it. And some of there, there is some Paleolithic um, art in Egypt that's very similar to European in the way it's depicting animals. Um, so yeah, I don't know what part of Egypt that is in. It certainly would seem reasonable uh -huh. <laughs> that it would be there. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, okay. So from a cultural perspective, then there really isn't any tie in with the hieroglyphic Egyptians as far as you heard? Other than the cattle, which do occur uh, on the um, in the temples, you know, that I see is about the only the only tie between the Nile and the Western Desert were the cattle, but not the Egyptian, what we consider typical Egyptian hieroglyphs. No. Right, because you said that the like the Karkor area was uh, three to four thousand years ago, so that would put it at contemporaneous with the, you know, the temples and such that you were describing earlier. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, oh, okay. So Anne Marimore says the paleo sites are in the Nile Valley. A dirt quega, if I'm pronouncing that right, identified them there. Um, and, and also Jeff Lefebvre says that he believes there was a pharaonic site that was found by Mark Borda at uh, Jebel Uwinat. That would be one of the sites I think you talked about, right? Oh, that's the mountain range to the south. Uh-huh. Jebel okay. Uwinat. Uh-huh. Yes. And, appara and apparently that's just one small set of glyphs and not tied in with the rock art. So that's a whole mountain range in there. And it wouldn't surprise me uh, to see uh, Paleolithic uh, rock art in that area. I mean, it's a, it's a large area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this might be a little off topic, but um, uh, Lee asks if you recall a lion hunt scene at the Belgium site. I'm not that sure what Belgium site means here. I do not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to work that one out uh, on your own there, I guess. Um, so I think, unless anyone has a last question, we've, I think we've gone through um, a number of topics. You've done a good job there, Mavis, of trying to field uh, all this, these questions about, a, about an area which, um, you know, you're learning about just as uh, anybody else. So um, we definitely appreciate uh, you sharing that with us. It's pretty fascinating to see it um, so close up the way you, you described it for us. Well, thank you. Next time I'll pick a topic that's a little closer to my research area. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is definitely worth it. I think everybody definitely enjoyed this. Um, so I will say uh, thanks again, uh, and everybody thanks you, uh, Mavis, for your presentation. Thanks to all the attendees for your interest. And again, if you'd like to learn more about what Arara does, please check out our website and our Facebook pages. Our next talk on April 10th will be Johannes Lubzer on the petroglyphs and pictographs of Georgia. So until then, uh, good evening and stay safe. <laughs>